This conference will now be recorded. Hello, everybody. Today, I thought I'd try something a little different. And uh, this is just based on my experience um, over the past uh, six months. And I thought I would put this together um, to help many of you that might be struggling out there. And uh, this uh, module is titled um, How to Be a Great Agent. And um, being a great agent will allow you to attract more clients, it'll allow you to sell more policies, and it will allow you to receive uh, many referrals. As always, in all of my training, there's always a disclaimer. I'm going to count to five in my head so you can read it. And if you want to read more, you can go back. Okay. So, first and foremost, how to be a great agent, the number one thing that I see a lot of agents lack um, out there, uh, not so much the ones that work with us, but people that I speak to and, and whatnot, is they're not prepared. And here's what I mean by that. It's very, very important to be prepared. And being prepared is not the same thing as knowing every single detail of every single product you're contracted to sell. It does not mean that you have to study every single brochure and that you need to know everything there is to know about the product before you go and talk to somebody about the product or before you even start to prospect people to talk about the product. I find agents waste more time learning about all the riders of the policy and all the nuances and you know what percentage of this is paid out if they have a critical injury on their toe and I find they spend more time doing that instead of trying to focus um, as to how or who they can sell the policy to. I'm not saying that these things are important. They are. They absolutely are. But you can easily read them in the brochure from a piece of paper rather than memorizing. Being prepared, what that means is that you need to know how to access the information to find the answer. So when you're sitting down with a client and the client asks you a question, you can't know everything. It's impossible, but you've got to know how to find the answer. You've got to know where to access it, okay? And that might be looking on the computer. It might be looking in a file. It might be looking in a brochure, and it might even be me calling the insurance company. But you've got to know how to access the information. You want to make sure that you have your insurance companies that you market and represent. You want to have their specific websites bookmarked. You want to have your, well, under name, it should say username. You want to have your username, your password stored. You want to have your agent codes in an easy to find place. You want all of this within lightning speed within your fingertips. You want a list of all the insurance companies underwriting hotlines, their customer service numbers, their fax numbers, their email addresses. You want all this in a very easy to find place. I keep a sheet. The sheet has every insurance company in one column. The next column is the website, the column after that is my agent code, then it's my username, then it's my password. And each time I update a password, I go to the sheet and I update it. And that way, if I'm ever anywhere, it's at my fingertips. I can instantaneously log into any insurance company's website. I can instantaneously call an insurance company. I can instantaneously do anything because I took the time out to be prepared. You need to know where to navigate what to do with the application. There are too many of you folks out there that are still doing paper apps. That is a thing of the past. That is over. You need to stick with e-apps. It's easier, it's cleaner, it's faster, it's more accurate. Business is processed faster. There's not mistakes or very little mistakes. You don't want to waste your time with paper. Learn to use the technology. Secondly, know your field underwriting. You know, there's a wealth of information that I've introduced in the group to the agents. I'm going to continue to introduce more. Uh, there's a lot of things out there that are called cheat sheets, and it gives you an opportunity to understand health conditions. You want to have these with you anytime you're on an appointment. You want to be able to go into your bag or reach over to your binder if you work over the phone. And when the client says something like diabetes with insulin, you want to be able to just you know, flip, 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 go to diabetes with insulin, and you'll see how your 10 insurance companies will treat them. Who'll decline them, who'll go modified, who'll go graded, who'll accept them in a Medicare supplement, who won't accept them for a simplified issue life insurance. You want to have those cheat sheets ready to go. And then more importantly, you want to learn how to run your own quotes. And this is for no other reason than for yourself. 
The last thing you want to do is be sitting in the room with a client. The client asks you for a quote for something, and you have to depend on another person in a different location than you are to provide you that quote. You're not self-supportive. You want to be able to be the one that does the quote and, and, and show it to the client and show the client multiple quotes on the spot because that's essentially what you do. You're an independent agent. You offer multiple carriers. Now, yes, there's going to be times where you can't or your internet connection isn't working or the app or the, the website is down and there's, there are certain circumstances where you're going to need to phone a friend and I completely understand that. But you'd certainly want to learn as best as you can to run your own quotes. I put a training video on there that will teach you how to run your own quotes. The other thing you want to do is you want to learn your own, run your own proposals. Um, and the reason is, and, and this is more of a selfish reason, I used to have people run my proposals. I would call my uplines and I would say, hey, listen, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about doing an annuity, $100,000. They want to take income in two years. Can you send me a, a proposal? And I would get the proposal and it never, it never really looked like what I actually wanted. Then I would have to go back and I have to be more specific. Long story short, you are the only one that knows your client. Okay, you know your client better than anybody else because it's your client, it's your prospect, you're connecting with them, you're understanding with them. You know when you're sitting down running that proposal, you're going to run that proposal customized to that individual. And nobody's going to be able to do it that way other than you. You're going to be the only one because it's your client. So when you learn to run your own proposals and you can spend time doing that, you can create a customized plan design for your customer, and that will essentially help you sell it because you're the one that created it. Rather than taking a proposal that showed up in your email, opening it up for the very first time, you really had really no input into it other than some parameters, and now you got to go and sell it. You don't own it at that point. It's not yours. You didn't create it. But if you created it, you own it. And when you own it, you can sell it. And these are the things that make an agent go from, from good to really great. These little, little nuances. The next thing is, is you must have a business plan and you must have a marketing plan. There are far too many out there, you guys out there that are just winging it. You're just shooting from the hip. You don't know where to go or what to do. Some of you are part-time, some of you are full-time, and I get it, I understand it, I'm not knocking anything down. Don't matter if you work one day a week or five days a week in the field, you specifically need to have a business plan and a marketing plan. You need both. What are your plans for the immediate future? What are your long-range goals? Don't say, I want to have a lot of Medicare residuals one day. That's my goal. That is not a goal, that is a dream. That is not a goal. You want to clearly define your path. You want to know exactly what you want when you want it. A goal is, is I want to have $10,000 in residual income within the next three years. That's a goal. Or I want to consistently earn $100,000 a year starting this year, 12 months from now. I want to start doing it this year. Those are goals. From there, you design a marketing plan, and we'll help you with it to get to that goal. If you're going to be selling final expense, how many policies do you need to sell to earn $100,000 a year? How many appointments do you need to see each week to sell these policies? How many leads do you need to buy each week to set the appointments to go see enough people to sell these policies? This all has to be written down and then you have to stick to it. You don't just wake up and say, I want to make $100,000 a year, and then you walk around town trying to sell insurance to anybody that asks a simple question about insurance. You have to have a clearly defined path. And more importantly, and I think everybody does a really good job at this, is you want to forge relationships. Your competitor is your best friend. Your competitor is good. I used to spend a lot of time trying to understand who else was buying my marketing. I would buy aged internet leads and I, and I would try to understand who else was buying it because they're the ones that are talking to the prospects. And I know that I just have to be better. So your competitor is good. You wanna know your competitor because you gotta know what your barometer is to be better. Make friends with everyone. You can learn from each other. There's enough business out there uh, for all of us to eat. You need to learn to, to master the sales techniques and strategies. You know, it's one thing to understand the product. I'm not saying you're not supposed to understand the product, but if you put all your time and energy into focusing on how the product works 
and you put no time and energy with putting somebody in a chair in front of you to talk about the product, you're never going to sell the product. You might as well just quit. Okay. You might as well just end, end, end the career, move on to something else. There's nothing wrong with it. You must, 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 must learn how to sell your products. It, it's not the same as learning your products. Yes, features and benefits are important, but who cares about those features and benefits is what you need to figure out. And more importantly, how can you get in front of those people that care so that you can talk about those features and benefits? Those are the two parts that you need to master first before you master precisely exactly what the cost of insurance is at age 63 years old. Okay, you can look that up on the spot. You don't need to memorize that, but you need to know who your features and benefits are gonna, gonna be sold to. And you wanna learn out of the starting gate cross-selling opportunities. Most agents can sell three to five different product lines. You gotta learn how they're paired. A med sup and a part D and a dental is a combo pair. Most agents that are good that sell med sups, they also include the part D and the dental. It's a package. Okay, it's a package. They give the client one large quote that includes everything. Med Advantage, Hospital Indemnity and Cancer, that's a bundled package. It's just every time you talk about Medicare Advantage, you should your mouth should have, a, assuming they have the scope of appointment form, your mouth should have Hospital Indemnity and Cancer coming out. Medicare Advantage are great plans. However, there are two major risks. Those two major risks are hospital and cancer. But guess what? We got a solution for it. It just just be part of your language. Med sup and final expense, accident, cancer, heart and stroke, hospital indemnity. These will all go together. The people that buy the one product buy the other product. The difference is, is they don't buy it from you because you're not talking about it. You want to learn the combos for bundling. Ask a lot of questions. I'm a question asker. When I'm on the phone with a client or a prospect or I'm sitting down with them, I am just like, it's just one question after the other. I want to learn everything I, I can about them. I ask two kinds of questions. I ask open probe. Open probe is a, a response other than yes or no. Um, and then a closed probe is a response that can only be yes or yes, no, or I don't know. I ask both questions when appropriate. Um, listen in for opportunities. When you listen in to your client, your client will tell you how they need to be sold. Okay, they will tell you what needs to happen in order for you to earn their trust and confidence. Okay, you have to listen in for it. They want a solution to their problem, not a product. Case in point, a person walks into a store, a hardware store, and they want to buy a hammer or a nail because they want to hang a picture. They don't have the hammer, they don't have the nails. The person isn't buying a hammer. They're not buying a hammer. They're buying the view on the wall in their house. They're buying the picture on the wall. The hammer is just a tool to get them to the goal. You don't sell products, you sell solutions. The products just get the person to the solution. Assume and don't assume. I know this sounds really crazy, but you want to assume, but at the same token, you don't want to assume. If you're having a conversation with a prospect, I always assume that they're going to be my client. If, if, they, if they've taken the time out to speak with me, if they've given me their time, I'm making the assumption that they're going to be my client. I just don't know what kind of client they're going to be, and I don't know when they're going to be a client. I don't know that yet, but I make the assumption that they're going to be my client, and I speak to them as if they already chose me to help them. And you guys would know this because of the way that I speak to all of you. If you think back from our very first conversation, it wasn't that I asked you to work with us. I made the assumption that you would. It's the same process. It's a very, very same process. You want to make that assumption from the moment you start talking that this individual is going to be your client. You just don't know when and you just don't know at what type of level or what type of client the person's going to be. And that will aid in your confidence. And if you don't have the confidence right now, this is what I tell everybody, you fake it until you make it. You pretend you got the confidence. And over time, the miracle will happen and you'll, you'll gain the confidence. Don't ever ask silly questions like, are you looking for a Medicare plan? That, to me, is a silly question. It's the same as somebody walking into a carpet store, and the salesperson comes up and asks, how can I help you today? I'm in a carpet store. What do you think I'm doing there? I'm here for a car. The only reason that person is in the carpet store is because they're looking to buy a carpet. 
or maybe they're not sure that they need a carpet, but they need something for the floor. And that's why they're in a carpet store. That's the only reason they're in there. The person sitting in front of you, you need to know before they get there, unless they blindly approached you, but before they get there, what are they sitting down with you for? How did they come in as a lead? What was the what was the ethical bribe that you used or that was used for you to get the two of you to sit down? Okay, was it something on Facebook? Was it something through direct mail? Was it a referral? You know, what was it that got that person down? And then you immediately go into addressing what that nature is. You don't ask, hey, so what are you looking for? You go into how can I help you? What what is it that we can do today to help you solve your goals and and, and uh, objectives? Instantaneously make assumptions. You want to evaluate every single piece of their insurance business for a better opportunity for them. Don't assume just because they told you that they have a life insurance policy that they bought eight years ago, don't assume that it's good. You don't know that until you look at it. And I could tell you half the time when you look at these old policies that there's going to be something better for them if you just took the time to review it. Same thing with Medicare supplement plans. If they had a Medicare supplement plan for one or two or three years, you got a dozen carriers that are probably priced better than them. You have to do the evaluation. Always ask them to review everything. And then finally, ask for referrals at every interaction you can. Ask for a check-in, ask for how, say things like, how am I doing so far? You can, you're in the middle of a second meeting and you could stop that second meeting. You could look at your two clients and you can say, I got a question to ask you. How am I doing so far? And they'll tell you. And then your next question could be is, what can I be doing better for you? And let them give you constructive feedback. You may find that you're doing everything that's meeting their expectations. Or you may find out at that point that they, they're a little disappointed in an area, but they're comfortable sharing with you. So now you've got an opportunity to rectify that. Okay? There's nothing wrong with asking, what can I be doing better? You work for them. You work for them. When it comes to referrals, a good way to ask for that is, uh, you know, when you feel confident, you got to feel confident, uh, fake it if, if, if you don't. But um, one of the questions you could ask them is, um, you know, is there anyone that you could think of right now that would benefit from working with me? The other thing that comes up a lot, and um, this kind of, you know, a little bit of a gray area in a sense, but do not make decisions for the client. Okay. You always let the client make the decision. Your job is not to decide for the client. Okay, that is not your job. Your job is to present to them the information and give them a choice. You let them decide. You can share the pros and the cons, but in the end, it is up to them to make the decision. It is not your decision. You should remove your personal emotions from the decision. You are not them. They are not you. You must be unbiased and objective 100% of the time with zero emotion. If the client is making a decision you do not agree with, it's okay to let them know this. You can tell them, I don't agree with what you want to do, and here are the reasons why. And if they still want to move forward, at the end, it is their decision. If you have provided all the facts, you've left nothing out, and they still want to go with something you don't agree with, you need to give the client what they want. Or you can refuse the business. There's nothing wrong with refusing business. You can refuse the business if it interferes with your moral and ethical values. Don't ever compromise your own morals and values for a piece of business that you wholeheartedly do not agree with. But don't think for a minute because a client doesn't want to go with your recommendation, they want to go with something else. Don't think for a minute that because that client made that decision, that the decision necessarily wasn't something that you would have done. Okay, so definitely don't get into the habit to make decisions for the client. You let the client make a decision. You know, the psychology of people is people want to want to know that they can make their own decision. Like I'm the kind of individual that wants to make his own decisions. Some of the times I don't, but for the most part, I want to make my own decisions. But I don't want 15 choices. I want two choices or three choices. I want 15 choices to be truncated down to two or three. And that's the message that I give off to clients. I give off to clients that there's 15 choices. There's more than one way to skin a cat. There's more than one path to get to where you want to go. However, we're going to take a look at all those choices. I'm going to truncate them down to what I think makes sense for you. I'm going to tell you the pros and cons of choice A, B, and C, but you are going to be the one that's ultimately going to make the decision. 
and people love that. You make it easy for them. You let them decide, okay? Rules to follow always when making a recommendation. If you guys stick to these three rules always, you will never have a problem ever in your career. And rule number one is whatever you recommend, it has to be designed to improve their situation. So whatever it is you recommend to them, it's got to be better than what they're doing now. It's got to be better. Number two, they have to understand it and it must make sense to them. So case in point, if you're recommending an IUL policy to somebody to max fund and take a tax-free retirement income stream in 36 years, and they're just not grasping the concept of the indexing crediting methods and policy fees and no lapse ratio and things of that nature, if they're just not grasping that, then you're, you're, you can't move forward with it. They have to understand it. They must understand it. And thirdly, it's got to be within their financial constraints. You cannot recommend them to pay for something when they, they absolutely can't afford it, when the money's just not there, even though they need the coverage. And we see a lot of this in the final expense industry. You know, agents will come across uh, clients that are, um, you know, on a very limited budget. They absolutely need life insurance. I know they do. You know they do. The client knows they do. But for them to buy life insurance means that they're not buying their grandchildren birthday presents. Or for them to buy life insurance, they're not able to go and have lunch with their sister once a month. Their budgets are very tight, so it's got to be within their financial constraints. And if you can meet all three criteria effectively, then your recommendation is one that should be implemented. The other, the other tip that I like to use is what, what I call the mother-father approach. Um, and the one, one thing you always want to ask yourself in your mind is, is this something that I would recommend to either my mother or my father? Um, or would this be something that I would buy myself if I was in their shoes? Okay. And if you can, if you could confidently answer those two questions as a yes, then you've made yourself um, a good recommendation. And then the last thing I wanted to do was I wanted to kind of go over some common agent mistakes. Again, this is not 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 a full list. This is just things that I've seen and heard, you know, over the years. And you know, the one the one thing that kind of stands out a lot is the priorities. Agents' priorities are never are never aligned correctly. When you're a newer agent to the industry, usually within one to two years, 90% of your time should be spent on prospecting, lead generation lead calling, appointment setting, and product presentations. And we got another word for that. We call that marketing. 90% of your time should be spent marketing. That's all you should be doing. Just marketing, 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 and marketing. The best problem you could have is a problem of too many appointments in one week. Um, I know that when I go through my ups and downs of marketing and I start doing some marketing when it becomes a little quiet uh, in the office, I know that I, I go into it, I put my head down, I get super busy, and then I complain the next couple of weeks because I can't keep up with processing the business. That's a good problem to have. I like that problem, okay? So priorities are misaligned. They spend more, agents spend more time on non-revenue generating tasks. The one major difference that I feel, this is just in a personal opinion, but the one major difference between an agent that makes $30,000 a year versus an agent that makes $100,000 a year. The one big difference between the two is that I feel that the agent that makes hundred grand a year is just simply a better marketer than the lower agent, the lower earning agent. The one that makes $100,000 a year gets in front of more people. And here's what I mean by that. If you take these two agents side by side and you put those two agents out there and you put them on the same amount of appointments with the same carriers, and the same everything, at the end of the year, the, the earnings difference between those two agents will be slightly different because one agent may have a better closing ratio than the other. And when I say slightly different, uh, assuming the agents are trained at least at a bare bones minimum, um, you'll probably see a difference of, let's say, uh, $10,000. And I'm just kind of using that as an example. But it's not a difference of 30 to 100. The $100,000 an agent isn't sitting down with the same amount of people the $30,000 a year agent is. They're sitting down with two to three times more people because they're simply a better marketer, okay? This is a business that is, it's not hard to learn 
And the people that make the most money have already figured out that it's all about sitting down with more people. You must spend three hours a day calling your leads. That's how you make 100 grand a year. You want to follow the 180, 180 rule. That's either 180 minutes of talk time on the phone or 180 minutes of dialing. Unless you have somebody setting your appointments, this is what you need to do. You need to do this every single day, every day that you work. You need to be prospecting. There is no easy path unless you're investing money to what we do. Unless you have five to $10,000 today to invest in marketing, there is no easy path. If you don't have that, you have to grind day in and day out. It's part of the deal. There are many agents out there that are making $100,000 or more each year. I know them. I talk to them. We're friends. But they all work hard and smart, and so should you. There is no secret lead, and there is no secret product to sell. I know sometimes I post on Facebook about how great the Facebook leads are and how cheap they are. I know there's other people that do that. But they're not secret magic leads. These aren't leads that... I paid $8 for that. I say hello and they say, thank God you called me. Like I've been waiting. I'm ready to buy. I have my checkbook in my hand. It doesn't work like that. Those leads exist, but those leads are over $100 each. Okay, so there's no secret lead and there's no secret product. We don't have secret products. All of our products are available to everybody. We all have access to the same stuff. What makes it different is, is a good agent will learn how to leverage the products to their advantage so that they can capture more business. So when I hear about a client talking about final expense, I know that I have products I can leverage to capture that business, okay? I know that I have price busting products. I know that I have products that accept risks that other, other agents may not have, and I know how to leverage that. Stop asking about closing ratios. I get that question a lot. Um, I don't mean to be harsh about it, but that, in my opinion, is one of the silliest questions to ask anybody. And any answer you get will be entirely fabricated and it should be viewed as a lie. And here's why. Your closing ratio and my closing ratio, no matter what the lead is, will always be different. I am extremely good on the telephones closing leads, but I am horrible on direct mail. I've done direct mail campaigns and I don't even think I've closed them at 6%. However, I know agents out there that are closing their direct mail campaigns at 30 and 40. Closing ratio means nothing. What is your closing ratio based upon how you learn to work the lead? Okay, so that's a silly question to always ask. It's a useless metric. It means nothing to you. A lead seller tells you what a close, closing ratio is on the lead. You need to hang the phone up and never talk to them again. What you need to look for is how many leads do you need in order to make your numbers? So you might be the type of individual that may need 40 leads in order to send 10 po sell 10 policies. I may only need 25 leads. That doesn't mean that the closing ratio of that lead is greater because of the lead. It just means it's greater because of the agent. And then finally, stop contracting with every carrier you hear about. Um, these groups that we're in, you know, somebody puts up a carrier and it's like eight people say I want it. That's silly. You're not helping anyone. You're basically wasting your time and you're taking it away from prospecting. Now you're gonna learn something new and then you're gonna learn how to sell it, but you already got one already. Zero in on the one or two carriers you have for each product category and master them. Those are your go-tos. You do not need 10 final expense carriers. You do not need seven Medicare Advantage carriers. I speak to agents that have seven Medicare Advantage carriers, three of them they've never sold the policy with in the three years that they've been doing Medicare Advantage. Why are you certifying for it each year? Why are you wasting that 35 or 40 minutes? That's 40 minutes you're going to be spent prospecting. That's a client that you're wasting on a carrier that you don't even sell and you never did. What's the point? Makes no sense. I kind of went off on a little bit here. You can tell I'm a little bit excited about this. Um, I love to train uh, agents. I love agents uh, that are very successful. I hope you got something out of this. I, I spoke uh, very direct. I, I let my uh, New York personality come out a little bit, 
but I certainly feel that some things have to be said. And I really hope that you take this and you become a better agent. I personally will do everything I can to support you. You guys all know that. And if you don't work with us, uh, maybe that's something that you need to consider. Um, I should have that slide here. I don't know where it is, but um, actually, nope, I didn't do it. So uh, in any case, my name is uh, Joe Tritola. I hope all is well. Um, if you wanted to speak with me, phone number is 561-276-3280.